Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hi welcome back So let us complete the mm, topic that we were discussing last time So essentially we started out by discussing the computational cost of implementing a DNS, right? And uh, we came up with this, um, so we, we looked at several things, right? Um, including uh, experimental data is to decide that where, you know, different modes of scales lie within a given solution domain, right? And we looked at this uh, plot, right? So we came up with this plot where um, k max eta is one point five is the 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 ones the modes of motion which are dynamically significant basically lie within a sphere of radius k max. So which is what I've drawn here, okay? And in that we have these. Um, okay, let's sort of. Okay, I can't do that here. So, yeah. So we in that we actually have this. Um, so radius is essentially r. Okay, and this again we have another radius which is shown in green, right? Which is k di, which is the limit of the dissipative range. So essentially, with this, um, the the one which is marked with yellow is a range or is a shell in which most of the dissipative um, motions you know are available um, and in the shaded region w with blue right so that's the region where one has the uh, initial sub range right that's the energy containing zone and the small circle right in, in inside that's the radius of k e right that's uh, where the uh, peak of the uh, energy spectra lies, right? So, the maximum energy containing modes are right there, okay? So, this is the domain that we are looking at, okay? And our job is to sort of calculate all these motions, right? So, what we are trying to figure out here, what we are basically realizing is that if I take this domain, you know, which is a sphere of radius k max, right? I do not have like an equal or, you know, even distribution of motions, okay? So, I think here Kolomogorov's length scales become uh, very, very important because now we know that uh, energy and, and, and again, uh, you know, not just Kolomogorov's length scales, but also the fact that energy, how energy is being uh, transferred, right, passed on. So, therefore, so based on those, we have, you know, the length scales where when I say dissipative range of motion, so that is the range we you know we, we are looking at and then you have inside the dissipative range also right where basically heat uh, the energy is being uh, converted to mechanical energy is being converted to uh, internal energy right using viscosity, but you also have a inner inertial sub range where the, there is it is still you know the viscosity the inertia effects are still not yet you know, completely 0. So, that lies somewhere within the, uh, the blue shaded region. And of course, the energy peak, some of the you know, peak energy motions are, are within the small region which is k i. Right? This is something we discussed uh, last time and this k um, d i. Okay. So, k it is about you know, 0 0.1 by eta, eta is the um, and length scale, Kolomogorov uh, and length scale, right? Okay, so um, okay, so now let us let me sort of write down here that it is really found. Okay, so what we find by doing this exercise, right, is that um, well, let me just write that down here as an as as an inference. Okay, so ninety nine point nine percent, right? So ninety nine 
So, 99.98 percent of the modes represented right have wave numbers. Okay, that is one statement. So, and okay. So, let us just say um, less than 0 0.02 percent right of the modes represent the motions. in the inertial sub range. Okay. So, what exactly are we saying here that k d i right. So, k d i is essentially this right. So, 99.98 percent right of the modes represented lie have wave numbers which is larger than uh, k d i. So, essentially this the so maximum you know the majority of the dissipative emotions actually lie within in, in that shell here right in that shell here maximum and in the inertial sub range which exists somewhere here right it is about 0 0.02 less than 0 0.02 percent of the modes. Right. This is something that we know. So, in that case, right. So, what happens then? You know, this actually then uh, you know gives you the motivation to sort of reduce the resolution in the dissipative range, right? Because most of the waves are in that zone, right? So that that, that that's I mean that's the way the domain is, right? So, now, now that we know all these things right, what are things that we can do sort of alleviate to alleviate the computational cost of DNS right. So, let us we basically will you know look at some of those things right. So, number 1 is essentially low wave number forcing. So, let me write that down. So, what I mean is um, some of those you know um, what, what can I say? So, we are basically saying that how can we I think you said that in the previous class that we are trying to tweak the existing DNS to see if we can alleviate the uh, computational cost. So, one of the things that you can do is right. So, like we said that um, you know like we said right here that most of the modes represented you know lie in the dissipative zone right. It is a very small percentage of the modes which are in the inertial sub range right and um, those length scales are even like lesser than this that is what we have just said right. So, what one of the things that can be done see when energy is transferred and we have talked about this earlier also I think I have mentioned this earlier. So, when energy enters turbulent uh, turbulent flow uh, uh, turbulent flow it enters through the largest scales of motion. So, if you supply energy it will first go to the largest en uh, largest eddies and from there it will cascade down to the uh, smallest ones right. But what we do here in terms of low wave number forcing is supply that energy, but supply it directly to the smallest of micro scale uh, and motions, motions in the micro scale length scale right, which will probably be you know target some of uh, these modes right. So, you directly supply that energy uh, to those motions right. Now, this of course, uh, you know it the, the these are unnatural and they do not, will not follow Naomi Stokes equation then what is the purpose well um, you do not really get uh, you know you do not really resolve all of the emotions by something like this but because there are certain um, you know properties of the 
um, uh, in the inner smallest scales of motion which are universal right which basically depend on um, uh, viscosity and dissipation this is something that we've said earlier so in the sense that the geometric definitions are lost which is therefore larger uh, um, eddies right so and the the path in which the energy is transferred that also is lost so here the the uh, the behavior at these length scales is very universal right so because of that so what we we can get we can get some extract some kind of information from that right so one of the things that is, is so essentially this is an artificial way right it, it's an artificial way and you can get up to you know higher Reynolds numbers right and we've said earlier that the Reynolds number so the number of modes that is required right it increases as the cube of the Reynolds number based on the turbulent uh, flow length scale or uh, six times or six times of the Reynolds number based on the smallest of the length scales right we've said that earlier now, so let me uh, sort of uh, write that down. Okay, so what I'm basically saying here is, uh, statistically, okay, stationary homogeneous turbulence. can be obtained in DNS okay, by artificially forcing The low, the, the low wave numbers okay yeah by providing energy to them okay So, in the sense that uh, uh, one of the things that is done to study the turbulence in this domain now that we have seen this is to provide energy right which will enter into that uh, flow domain through the largest um, uh, eddies. So, you provide that energy and now see what happens how the energy is cascading how the you know geometry is changing and so, so on and so forth right. So this is typically what is done. So, this is another way of, so this is another way you know where you know you do not provide the energy uh, to the largest scales, but actually go and send you know provide this to the smallest of length scales right. So, these motions it is so energy containing motions are therefore unnatural and do not follow uh, Navier-Stokes equations. If you if you sort of this is an artificial, so artificially forcing right. So, energy containing motions unnatural and do not follow Navier Stokes equations, right? And um, this does not, like I said, you know, it does not really solve the whole turbulent flow domain completely, but it gives us some information. So, to give you an example of that, say, um, so n is the number of uh, modes in each direction. So, okay, let me sort of do that. This is an example. For example, um, so this is n, 
right. So, n is essentially the number of modes in each direction, okay. then total number of modes right now that is actually equal to n cube okay then without forcing with forcing right so we i'll give you a couple of examples in the sense what is the maximum reynolds number that i can actually um, look at right so because i think i le mentioned last class that uh, given the you know given a turbulent flow then the maximum number of r lambda which is essentially the reynolds number in the uh, smallest of uh, length scales that you can get up to with gigaflop computers is 100 that's all right but we want to get more so here n is essentially the number of motions motions or say modes okay in each direction right so i have two examples here so say n is 256 right so total number will be 256 cube so without forcing the r lambda that is reached is 60 this is uh, and the r lambda is 180 right now this uh, this is referenced in the bo book of pope and you can sort of look that up okay so this is an actual experiment that you know people have done and this is um, and this is a result okay then another is if n is 512 okay total number of modes is this right and the max with forcing the maximum reynolds number that has been reached is this right so it makes a lot of difference so it makes a lot of difference uh, if i you know do this essentially okay Okay, so we'll you know make final comments when we get there. So, you know, this is so this is one way. Okay, all right. So what I'm basically trying to say here, kind of repeating myself, I guess, is that we have several motions, right? In a like we said for in a in a in a turbulent flow, like we said in the last class, that there are length scales vary right very quite a bit we have the columnar length, length scales which are like really small and then we have the larger eddies right then we also have uh, you know reynolds numbers which are widely variant right uh, and then we have the wave numbers so now, so the wave numbers and which is what we're seeing here that if you take a domain which is of uh, a diameter of 2 k max k max being, being the uh, wave numbers of the highest dispersive motions so then this is my this is my domain right this is my domain which i'm looking at it's a sphere of diameter 2 into k max or radius k max and in this band which is shown in yellow so most of the dissipative you know motions or most of the motions actually lie here it's only 0.02 percent of the uh, uh, mo energy containing modes actually lies somewhere here it is the initial sub range. So, initial sub range is located somewhere over here and the maximum uh, the peak of the spectra right um, which we had uh, also seen from the experimental uh, distribution is, is somewhere over there right. So, what would be the most so the high I guess the all the kind of methods that we are looking at. So, we are trying to see what since these are distributed so randomly and they are not distrib their distribution is there is nothing uniform about that right. So, what could be what could we use right to sort of you know make the maximum take the maximum advantage of that right. So, when we said low wave number forcing so some of the things so one of the things the moment you see this you are like oh so most of the waves are actually contained in this region you know then we can have a slightly you know reduced resolution there 
right? Because if I reduce the, res uh, re reduce the resolution somewhere here or here, then I might miss out, right? I might miss out on the wave. But this is more densely populated, so I can do that. So that's the kind of thought process, right? So now we, so we're having this picture having this picture. So, our job is cut out as to how we go and decipher or resolve all these motions. Right? So, one of the things that we, so we, one of the ways of doing that is what I described just, uh, just uh, I mean right now is the low wave number forcing. Right? So, you have this low wave numbers which are here. So, you provide energy to them. Right? So, you provide energy to them and um, which is unnatural, which is unnatural and they do not follow the Navi Navier-Stokes, right. So, then why am I doing it? Because it does not really represent the turbulent flow as such, but you can get some, you can extract some information from there, right, which is what we are doing and we saw that, you know, I can actually, um, get, uh, I can actually get up to uh, you know uh, Reynolds numbers in at the micro scales which are much higher than without forcing right okay now the next thing is of course we are all familiar okay LES right so what do we do in uh, LES well? In LES, essentially the energy contained modes are resolved and the effects of the unresolved uh, modes are modeled, as simple as that. Okay. So, um, in LES, energy uh, the energy contained modes are resolved right and effects of unresolved modes are modeled okay that's your alias okay there is something else, there is something else. So, another way, so another method okay, is some is called hyperviscosity. Okay. Now, what do we do here? Okay. So, what we do here is we essentially replace the viscous term. right we replace this by okay okay for integer m right and this thing is the hyperviscosity coefficient hyperviscosity coefficient okay now what this essentially you know the how is this helping us right what this is you know doing is in wave number space right this corresponds
to changing, right? Right? This to right. So, essentially this results in making the dissipative range making the dissip uh, you know dis dissipative or dissipation dissipative uh, region narrower right makes it narrower okay such that you require less more, uh, you know wave numbers to resolve lesser number of wave numbers are to be resolved right so that's hyperviscosity okay further we have still you know even one more right so, which is essentially the sparse mode methods. Okay. What do I mean by that? Let me write that down. Sparse mode sparse mode methods. Okay. So, here the energy containing modes are completely resolved right that is. So, this is the region right. So, and the, the energy containing modes in this zone basically right for r le, you know less than k uh, k e right. So, that is completely resolved. Right. So, in sparse mode um, methods, so energy containing modes are completely resolved. So, energy containing modes are completely resolved. Okay. And in shells of um, you know higher wave number, right? In this method, and for higher wave numbers, okay. right where this etc right and so essentially here only a fraction okay let me this is become a little congested sorry about that Okay. So, energy containing modes are completely resolved and for higher wave numbers right. So, essentially uh, a fraction which is only uh, uh, you know fra a fraction of the Fourier modes are uh, represented which is only a fraction which is
right of the Fourier mode is represented. Okay. Right. So essentially that is all. Okay. So, we have a DNS right and we think that if we may, we can tweak you know uh, the DNS or uh, essentially we are trying to see how we can decrease the computational cost of the DNS right and so we have come up with several methods right. One is the um, uh, low wave number forcing, the other is of course the LES, then we have a something called a hyper viscosity and then we have you know sparse mode uh, methods. Okay. Now, uh, so, but it is very, so all of these things right. However, so like I said you know we will need to write something here, you know, write a note and basically say that all these methods you know, all these methods that I spoke about uh, have you know substantial deviations from the Navier-Stokes equations right and uh, so they are not nowhere near like direct numerical simulation right of the turbulence and it is only a model. Okay. So, let me just sort of write that down, um, it is important to appreciate that. Okay. Um, all the um, uh, all the methods substantially deviate right from the navier stokes equations Okay. and there is no way it is a DNS of turbulence. So, they are not DNS of turbulence okay. and each is a model whose accuracy is not known is unknown. I think that is all I will uh, you know talk about the um, DNS and its cost and what we sort of you know uh, do about that. Okay. So, um, uh, zero spectral methods as I, uh, you know, and I said. So, the point is that we did discuss DNS right. It has a certain computational cost we are seeing how we can alleviate that and we did come up with you know a couple of methods. And what we now see is that they actually deviate sub substantially from the Navier-Stokes equations and definitely there are no way you know the DNS of turbulence. However, each is a model whose accuracy is also not known a priori. Okay. That is where we have to leave it in the sense that then we make I guess judicious choices when we you know decide to study a problem. Okay. All right. So, now um, so I think where we are slowly inching towards now is to uh, slowly go and see that how we can actually you know solve this. So, we will do the CFD bit you know uh, very soon, but before that Okay. I would like to talk about uh, you know a couple of you know models which you. So, you will see when you go to you know uh, ANSYS which is very popular right. You use a turbulence model right. You use the K, K epsilon model, K omega model right, uh, K omega SST model right. So, the shear stress transport right. You do not even know what that is. So, I think what we, we will try to now do is slowly we are we inching there we, you are hearing this word model right. So, we are going to resolve those uh, you, you know some of the uh, wave numbers and the rest of them we are going to model. I think this is something that we have said in the course of 
you know, describing these things. So, I think we are inching towards that. Right? So, before, so let us sort of, now, now the point comes that, okay, now let us see. Now, today, of course, we have better computing facilities, better computing power, more importantly. So, um, let us see, right, how methods have developed and um, what, you know, characteristic each one has, right. Okay. Let me sort of write down a few things, okay. We can sort of discuss uh, again in a little more in detail, okay. Let me go to another page, okay. So, let me uh, just write down these things first, okay. okay. So, the velocity right we wrote down as right. So, this is the Ras decomposition right and then of course, you have the continuity momentum energy. So, from continuity Okay. Right. So, which means, which means right and Okay. Next, of course, we have the uh, momentum equation. Okay. Let me write this: the momentum equation and then the mean momentum equation. Okay. So let me. Um, okay. I think fine. Let me write that down. Okay. So just to remind you, you know. So. So, momentum equation is this, right? And I'm not sort of you know driving it further. We've sort of done this before. Now mean momentum equation then, right? So that is equal to see how that is different from the mean um, the momentum equation. So, that is the mean momentum equation. Okay. So, Reynolds equations are basically now, right, how is this different from the Navier Stokes? If I look at the mean momentum equation, 
we have said this earlier other than the mean values. So, essentially the Reynolds stresses get introduced right this we I mean you know we found that out. So, Reynolds stresses is introduced and also what we have seen earlier is that the kinetic energy right the turbulent kinetic energy is half the trace of the um, Reynolds stresses right. So, so we so essentially turbulent k right which we are representing by just this k right this is equal to half the Reynolds stresses. right ok. So, if I write that in words, so the turbulent k is equal to one half of the trace of the Reynolds stress. Now, um, we will do something called a turbulent viscosity hypothesis. Okay. Let me sort of you know briefly uh, today because of the lack of time and we will write down the equation we will discuss this uh, little, you know more in detail. So, let me just write this down. Um, so, this is something that we know already we have what I am writing out so far. Okay. So, what I am coming to is this turbulent viscosity hypothesis. Okay. So, what is this right what is this? So, this was um, introduced by Buzanesk in the late 19th century right it is mathematically analogous to the fact that stress is proportional to strain right in a Newtonian fluid it is linear it is linearly related right stress and strain. So, this one um, it was introduced by Buzinesk ok is mathematically analogous to stress being proportional to strain actually being linearly proportional to strain. So, strain linearly in a Newtonian fluid. So, this was like I said it was um, ok. So, I got this extra u and this is not that ok. So, introduced by Bosnix in like I said the late 19th century is mathematically basically saying that the stress strain stress is proportional to is linearly proportional to strain in a uh, Newtonian fluid that that is the in a, an analogy right. So, the Reynolds stress right the Reynolds stress right. So, this 
this right ok. So, this is actually going to result in the diagonals ok you know that ok is proportional to the mean rate of strain. So, this Reynolds stress is proportional to mean rate of strain right. So, that is that ok. This is equal to ok. So, if you see this, this is actually equal to 2 rho mu t and this is something that you know we can represent that as s. So, uh, we have seen that that is rate of strain ok. So, ok. right where is turbulent of eddy viscosity ok. Ok and essentially I can also say that effective viscosity right this plus turbulent viscosity ok. Now, um, just one more thing before we stop. So, now right that is equal to effective ok ok Okay. So, essentially this is the same as Navier-Stokes equation ok. Let me let me write that down it is same as Navier-Stokes ok except ok except um, you of course in place of q ok. Gamma effective in place of gamma ok and p is modified So, the, this, equ this equation that I just wrote back here in equation 3. So, in that, so what I can write here is actually, so from say 3 right. Now, right now that is equal to t 
turbulent viscosity. That, right? So, essentially, in a simple shear flow, right? easy to visualize right what we are basically saying is that the shear right is nothing so this is exactly similar to what we've learned earlier the shear is nothing but viscosity into velocity gradient which is what we're doing here except that you know you can see you're looking at the turbulent quantities um, here right and this is the uh, turbulent viscosity and then this is the mean velocity right so let's just uh, say what yeah so turbulent viscosity is this right and the effective viscosity is turbulent viscosity plus and this is what we've been doing so far right every pr property we write that as a mean property and a turbulent part so which is i think is being done even to the effective viscosity so we write that as a viscosity part and the turbulent part right and then kind of boils down to the same thing. So, then this is how your equation kind of changes this is your momentum equation kind of changes. So, I think I should sort of write this down ok. We will discuss this a little more I just kind of wrote down the equations first because they are quite a bit ok. So, let me just I think I will call this as 4. Yeah, so if you see how the equation changes, so this is again, you know, it is the, it is the Navier-Stokes equation, except that this is the, diff, the these are the uh, modifications which we have done. If you see, right, especially this is the gamma effective is uh, here, and the pressure is modified in uh, this fashion. Okay, so essentially, again, so this uh, term, right, if if I so, it essentially boils down to the fact that we are looking at shear, right. Okay, so, I think we will stop here and take this up again in the uh, next class. So, thank you.